I'm still using the kiln that I grew up with. This is the first time I've actually done some uh, kiln work on this unit. Always uh, save um, the refractory brick that has broken off. Um, this will be used um, to refurbish the brick. Um, however, we're going to be using repair cement. And this is what I'm using. Uh, save these shards. You can cement them in, which I will uh, show you and demonstrate in the next video. But I want you to see how I'm cutting this out. Uh, I'm taking a Zacto knife, and where there's a, a break in which um, I can't uh, uh, locate the shard or it has uh, fractured into too many tiny bits, what I'm doing is I'm preparing it to receive a square chunk of refractory brick that I will tailor just for this hole. So introduce the cut by different levels like this. See, just like that. Now, you don't want to violate this straight edge um, and break a whole shard off here. So I'm going to finish up my line here. It's actually really good to have um, sometimes tin foil or plastic so you don't drop in stuff. And the element, I forgot to do that because of the video. So what I'll do is take a vacuum. All right, so I went ahead and I measured out each section that I just um, cut uh, last segment. And I went ahead and I measured out the uh, dimensions with solid edges. So make sure that you cut solid edges. And what I like to do personally for make sure that uh, you measure twice uh, so you only need to cut once is use uh, like a sign, um, like a yard cell sign, the corrugated plastic. Well, I'm talking about the yard signs. And um, go ahead, cut your measurements. Okay, here's something to know. When you cut the block, make sure that you get a general oversized section of your brick that you're going to cut off. Um, and then go ahead and dwindle it down to actually fit your cut. Refractory brick, and it is just one brick. Uh, you can buy uh, any refractory brick from practically anywhere. Uh, you can buy even at Lowe's, Home Depot. I personally brought um, the brick from a ceramic shop. So went ahead and um, I scored the whole brick. As you can tell, I actually went a little bit deeper than a score. Okay, so when I take my handsaw, the blade fits in nicely and it's not gonna slide back and forth. I went ahead and put my block up here. I can go ahead and handsaw it. It's better to over, over bite the cut. Cause you want a clean cut, especially if the cut is going to be the exact cut that uh, is going to be used in your space that you're patching. Okay, so here you have it. And this is one of the reasons why I say cut off a little bit more than what you need to chew. Because um, when I was, it is very, very um, a porous brick, very, very uh, airy, if you will. So it breaks easily and sometimes you get more or less. So you want to make sure that you have more than less to work with. Uh, you always want to give yourself at least... Uh, an eighth taller in the depth because um, you are going to sand this flesh or plumb with the rest of the edges. So when you uh, close the hatch, everything is perfect. There's no air escaping. Now, if, if you do cut a little bit too much, like I just did a little bit, that's okay. I did forget to say that you should be wearing a mask when you're dealing with any type of um, brick like this. Uh, it's not good to get in the lungs. Okay, so what I went ahead and did is to prepare the brick for the laying of the cement was a little quart of water used just a basic synthetic sponge, went ahead and wet it, uh, the brick that will receive the uh, brick uh, for the repair, and also the brick itself. And this is gonna make sure that um, so the cement doesn't dry out too quickly. When the cement dries out too quickly, uh, it's normally because it's uh, the two bricks are sucking the moisture out and it cracks and doesn't adhere whatsoever. So I went ahead and pre-wet it this section. And uh, you only need a little bit of water. Only a little bit. And you want the cement to have the same consistency of chocolate pudding. So if it's a small piece, it'll probably take about an hour for it to dry and then you're ready to go. This is the one that I sanded down. As you can tell, it is flush now with the top. And I just took um, a sanding pad, brush that down. This is my replacement on the bottom. I don't know if you remember, but um, that bridge was fallen. You know, it doesn't need to look pretty um, because the main thing is to insulate and make sure that the elements are in proper place. As you can tell, I patched that as well. 
and also the bottom of some of the cracks. Now I'm going to be replacing the elements. This is the bottom element, which means it has two row rows and uh, one ramp that will go down on. I went ahead and I found the hole. I don't know if you can see that. Went ahead and found the hole, pumped that through. And as you can tell, that's the rod right there. I'll show you here for demonstration. Okay, you have your pen, you've got your little elbow here, and gently put it through. I don't know if you can even see that. You see that? It's just right through, and it's touching both sides very lightly. And you're going to put it in on an angle. All this element is doing is carrying a short. So now I have it completely wrapped around. Okay, now we get to the point of hooking up the elements to our control box. I went ahead and I put the uh, insula insulators uh, here. Make sure that it's always all the way back so there's no uh, wire of the element being exposed anywhere else. Right now I'm working with plenty of uh, element wire. Now I'm working on cutting these to size. What I did was I went ahead and um, I stripped T-snip. Made sure that uh, none of the wires was all hairy. Went ahead and put the uh, connector here. Uh, all what you really want to do is establish a surface area, a connection between the wire and um, the connector here. Um, and what I did, it, they're very actually very hard to do with just regular hand pliers uh, to crimp it. So what I like to use is channel locks that have a spring, spring loaded, and that way you can go on the smallest bite, get it squared up, press, and go ahead and it uses all that leverage. Snap in. And uh, of course you can't see that, but as you can tell a little bit, it's kind of flat. Remember, so you make this top so you get the right dimensions here. You don't need a whole lot. Where the safety glasses, go ahead, there we go. And really the wire needs to go directly to the middle of the, the crimp of the uh, connector. Make sure that's hitting that bridge. As you can tell here, I don't have my indicator light, the burn light on. So I brought it's the hardest thing to find online replacement. So I brought the same voltage and wattage uh, for the, drawer, uh, the uh, burn light, whoever it's smaller. So I got a washer and it springs right in, snaps like that. That way it doesn't fall back in. So I didn't get to finish the video for us. What happened was kind of funny. I turned off the uh, camera to go ahead and plug in the kiln to see if the indicator light was on. And everything was running smoothly before I filmed again. And I forgot that I did not mount my indicator light, the burn light. And uh, I didn't have the wires insulated enough. And um, the prongs had hit the side of the control box, metal on metal. And uh, within about one second, it, uh, I mean, it was light. I mean, talk about sparks, a loud pow. And uh, I actually hurt my hand a little bit. I had um, some soot <laughs> actually near my hand because uh, I bent down to look at the indicator light because it was burning beautifully and I just didn't think any of it. And then it kind of uh, blew in my face a little bit. As you can tell, it's just burnt. So be careful of that. But that's why I couldn't finish with a, a polished ending. But uh, thank you for taking this journey along with me.